Welcome to Bitcoins and Gravy, episode number 66. At the time of this recording, Bitcoins are trading at $240 each, and everybody's favorite LTB coins are trading at .000088 US dollars each. Mmm, mmm, mmm. Now that's gravy. Welcome to Bitcoins and Gravy, and thanks for joining me today as I podcast from East Nashville, Tennessee, with my trusty Siberian Husky Maxwell right by my side. Say hello, Maxwell. (laughs) We're two Bitcoin enthusiasts who love talking about Bitcoins and sharing what we learn with you, the listener. Longtime listeners, thank you so much for hanging in there and for your generous tips. And new listeners, welcome to the show. We hope you enjoy it. On today's show, I interview Pamela Morgan, the CEO of Third Key Solutions. Pamela works closely with Andreas Antonopoulos, who serves as the chief technology officer, and with Richard Kagan, the business advisor. Third Key Solutions can design a foolproof plan for your company to securely generate and store private keys to help reduce the risks of embezzlement, coercion, and fraud. This is a major step forward, friends, as we travel together here at the dawn of the age of cryptocurrencies. And a quick side note, friends, during this interview, we had a slight Skype problem that unfortunately caused us to lose a bit of valuable content. Pamela spoke highly of Richard Kagan, the business advisor for Third Key Solutions, but in editing this, I was unable to save this segment of the interview. Very sad. Suffice it to say, though, folks, that when you combine attorney Pamela Morgan with Andreas Antonopoulos and Richard Kagan, you have a powerhouse of a team that exemplifies intelligence and integrity. Ladies and gentlemen, I am thrilled to be speaking today with Pamela Morgan, the CEO of Third Key Solutions. Pamela, welcome to the show. Thanks so much for having me. I'm thrilled to be here. Oh, it's great to have you. And do you mind if I read a little intro first? No, that'd be great. Okay, this is great stuff. Pamela is an entrepreneur, an attorney, and an educator who has spent most of her career working in and advising small businesses. She began focusing her law practice on Bitcoin and cryptocurrencies in early 2014. She's a widely respected authority on multi-signature governance, smart contracts, and legal innovation with cryptocurrencies. Third Key Solutions is the culmination of her work advising Bitcoin startups in multi-signature governance processes and key management. Whew. <laughs> That's some great stuff. Well, thanks. You did very well. That's a lot to get out in one sitting. So well done. Well, so, okay, look, you're an attorney and somebody introduced you to Bitcoin and now you're somehow in the Bitcoin sphere. Tell us how that happened. Sure. So actually, I was introduced to Bitcoin when I was speaking about entrepreneurship education in Athens, Greece. I was there speaking at the Disrupt Conference, and it was a conference about disruption in all sorts of of areas, including entrepreneurship education. And uh, someone who's known and loved throughout the industry, Andreas Antonopoulos, was there, and he was speaking about Bitcoin. And that was my first exposure to Bitcoin. I had no idea that it even existed. And I heard this speech about the power of Bitcoin and how it could really impact people's lives. And that's what I've wanted to do my entire life. So my entire career has been really focused on helping people, typically in small businesses, but helping people reach their goals. So whether I'm teaching college, whether I'm practicing law, whether I'm doing the other things that I do, uh, it all kind of revolves around this idea of helping people um, accomplish their goals and, and changing the world at the same time. Okay. So I found out about Bitcoin and I was just completely taken aback. I thought it was the coolest thing I'd ever heard and I needed to know more. So I did a ton of research, spent a lot of time focused on the programming behind Bitcoin, I read the white paper and and really looked at why is this so great and what what could it actually do to change lives. And after that, I decided to leave my uh, my profession at that time, which was entrepreneurship education, and really focus all of my attention on Bitcoin and my law practice. Wow! So that's that's how I got involved. Now, how has that been received by your family and friends and coworkers? Fantastic! Oh wow! Actually. Um, 
I'm passionate about Bitcoin and, and I really don't do things that I'm not passionate about. Uh, so it's pretty easy for me to convince my friends and family that this is something fantastic. And I think it's really easy once you, especially if you have a personal relationship with someone, mm -hmm. you can start talking to them about what this actually means for people, you know, how this can actually streamline payments, how I could send my mother you know, Bitcoin wherever I am in the world and it doesn't matter and I can send it instantaneously if she needs something. Uh, and that's that's really powerful when you hear it from someone that you know and respect. So my friends and family have been incredibly supportive. I think I'm fortunate in that way. Wow, that's great. I think that you also have a persuasive platform upon which to stand when you speak. Uh, you're an attorney. You have that background. And so when you're speaking from that platform, I think people are more likely to listen to you. Well, the reason I say that is by comparison, me, if I'm speaking to my brother-in-law, who is an attorney, works for a really good firm, it's really hard for him to take me seriously because I'm a podcast host. I have a background in research. I'm also a musician, but I'm not an attorney. I don't have a voice of authority. So I really think that's been part of the reason why it's been so difficult for me to communicate about Bitcoin with him. Um, I have to blame myself and my approach, my delivery, but uh, he has absolutely no interest in it. And, you know, that saddens me in some ways because I think that if he did, he could be doing some things that are positive in the Bitcoin world that are making a difference other than just doing uh, the law that he's doing, which I, I won't comment further on. It doesn't really matter. He'll never listen to the show. <laughs> <laughs> well, before before you take the blame yourself, and, and of course, this isn't directed directly at your brother, but <laughs> brother many... Brother-in-law. <laughs> brother-in-law, excuse me. Um, but, but many attorneys are what we in the tech field describe as Luddites. So um, attorneys are <laughs> fairly reluctant to adopt new technology. And I really think, I've given a lot of thought to this because I, I wonder why many of my colleagues aren't as excited to adopt um, new technology. And I think it's because in law school, we're taught that what's tried and true is what you should stick with. Mm -hmm. And that's why contracts are so long and many times we use language that normal people can't actually read and mm. normal people, including myself. You know, a lot of times it takes us a long time to get through contract language, but we put it in there because it's tried and true by the courts. Mm. And so this kind of holding on to the past so tightly because we're sure we know it's it's a known risk sort of situation, right? Yes. So I know what the risks are if I put this language in. I know what the risks are if I use this technology from, you know, 1990. Mm -hmm. I know that, you know, every so often my computer is going to crash, right? I know if I'm using WordPerfect, you know, what what's going to happen there. But if I adopt new technology, now I don't know what the risks are. And because lawyers are, are typically risk adverse, it's less likely. I think that's one of the primary driving factors behind the reluctance to adopt new technology and specifically Bitcoin. Hmm. Um, I would like to point out very quickly, just in the event your brother-in-law does listen to the podcast, <laughs> uh, there are a number of really interesting legal projects that are happening in the space that don't necessarily require an in-depth understanding of, of Bitcoin per se. One of them is Common Accord. Have you heard of that? I have not, no. It's a really interesting project uh, started by a man named Jim Hazard, and he's got some really smart people working on it, like Primavera de Filippi from Harvard. And they're working on this kind of open source legal contract language, whereby there are specific contract clauses that are referenced with code. So it's a marriage of computer code with uh, t with technical legal language. And why it's cool is because attorneys can contribute to this code repository and they will work on the back end to be able to pull that language in to smart contracts that will be executed on the blockchain or even those that are being executed outside the blockchain. Wow, that sounds great. Now tell me, what's that called again? It's called Common Accord, C-O-M-M-O-N, a -C -C -O -R -D dot org. Common Accord. Okay. And any other uh, just off the cuff recommendations, things you could recommend to my brother-in-law? Um, sure. There's a workshop series happening. It's called the Blockchain Workshop. And the first one was in November at uh, MIT. The second one was in January at MIT and Harvard. Third was at Stanford. And the fourth is going to be at Cambridge. It's coming up in June. And the Blockchain Workshops are intended to get really smart people in a room and talk about what's happening with the law and this technology. 
So there are a number of working groups. One of them is crypto equity. So for those of your listeners that are really interested, as I am, in the new SEC rules and allowing uh, crowdfunding and kind of marrying crowdfunding with equity, the legal questions surrounding those issues are being taken up by one of the working groups. Another working group is the smart contracts working group. And so this looks at what is a smart contract and how is it implemented? And then from the legal perspective, what happens when you shift burdens and you actually have a full electronic implementation? Uh, What happens when you have, you know, a lot of people are really into the Internet of Things right now. Mm Uh, did you see the video with the, I think it was the dishwasher Oh yeah. that, yeah, <laughs> that, that like ordered its own soap. <laughs> so the question, you know, for those of us that are legal nerds, the question is, well, what happens if that dishwasher decides to buy 5 million gallons of soap? Hmm. Who's responsible for that? Right. Is there someone responsible <laughs> for that? And should there be, you know, legal rights and responsibilities of autonomous agents? What does that look like? What do we want it to look like? Because we can't actually, you know, draft contracts and draft regulation until we figure out what we want it to be from a societal perspective. Right. So the blockchain workshops are bringing together not only lawyers, but also uh, coders, thinkers, people that are smart, people that are interested in these sorts of questions and really kind of hashing it out. Um, And as I said, it's working group, not conference. So they always have a little uh, conference. I shouldn't say little, but a conference that is open to the public. Typically, it's two days after the working group conferences where uh, what we found and what we've talked about is presented to anyone that wants to come. So it's an interesting opportunity for members of the community to get involved Involved with these sorts of heady legal questions. So if that's what you're into, um, maybe you should look up blockchain workshops. Okay. Wow, that's great stuff. So now what initially, tell me again, what initially took you to Greece? I was speaking about entrepreneurship for persons with disabilities. Okay. Oh, wow. Okay. And that's something that you champion still? Yeah. I mean, entrepreneurship is a passion of mine. Uh, I grew up in small businesses and, and I've been working in them almost my entire professional career. Uh, I think that entrepreneurship is is really the way, and especially for persons with disabilities, um, the unemployment rate is so high for people that have disabilities that mm. really, uh, you know, starting your own business is is one way to generate income. I see. That makes sense. That makes a lot of sense. That's uh, just that advice right there going out to anyone who has disabilities. That could be empowering just to hear that. Wow. I could do something other than just going around and searching for a job. Yeah, that's great. Oh, yeah. Make your own job. And there are a lot of opportunities for funding that as well. And although that's outside of the scope really of of our conversation, um, a quick Google search would, would show a number of funding opportunities everywhere in the world for this sort of thing. This is something that people care about and people want to put money behind. So it might be worth looking at. Okay, that's great. So you were in Greece and then you heard someone speak about Bitcoin. Was that Andreas Antonopoulos actually? It was, Okay, yeah, he's very compelling. He's an amazing speaker. Sometimes I think that he had a chip implanted and that's how he, (laughs) but he assures us that it's actually just years of public speaking experience. I have a background in public speaking, but I'm nothing compared to that guy. He's just absolutely phenomenal. And he, he can take a subject and he can make it interesting. But you know, the subject of Bitcoin is already fascinating. And then you bring this guy from a securities background, from a tech background, you know, to talk about Bitcoin articulately and to, even throw in a little bit of humor there and some interesting anecdotes. I mean, the guy's just amazing. That alone is why you are interested in Bitcoin right now, I would think. I have no doubt, you know, had I seen someone else speak who was less passionate, who was less compelling, it might have floated right by me. (laughs) But yeah, it was it was an incredible speech. And, you know, everyone in the room was moved by that. And it's my understanding that it's it's a really popular video. I, you know, I send it to people when they ask me, how did you get involved in Bitcoin? I'm like, well, here, this is how I got involved in Bitcoin. <laughs> you know, so it's nice that YouTube's there to, to to bring people in on that. But yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. So now your company is Third Key Solutions. You're the CEO. And if yes. I'm not mistaken, Andreas is the chief tech officer. Yes, that's true. Wow. So uh, <laughs> we also have a, a, another person that's working with us, Richard Kagan, who's a business advisor. But um, yeah, so Third Key Solutions really grew from my law practice. So as I mentioned before, you know, after the Disrupt Conference, I was really interested in Bitcoin and and started looking at smart contracts and started looking at, at all of these ways that I could serve people in this space. And I started taking clients um, that were specifically interested or operating in Bitcoin. 
And this question kept coming up over and over again. And the question was, hey, we want to implement multisig. Can you hold a third key for us? Mm -hmm. And in many cases, I would say no. And the reason is because I don't do escrow or dispute resolution. Mm -hmm. And the reason that I don't do it is because although it sounds really nice and neat and in a bow, um, the actual action of arbitration is much more muddy than what people typically think it is. Hmm. So this idea of having a third party, you know, resolve disputes is great. Don't get me wrong. It's fantastic. Sure. But that third party needs to have some parameters as to how they resolve a dispute. And it doesn't necessarily keep you out of court. It just means that maybe a different person is going to go to court. I see. <laughs> so, <laughs> um, you know, so anyway, I was asked, you know, repeatedly, hey, can you hold a third key for my business operations? And me being the person that I am, I don't typically just limit my questions to, uh, sure, what exactly do you need? I start asking um, bigger questions like, hey, well, how are you operating? How do you plan to operate? Mm -hmm. How are you going to implement this multi-signature address? You know, are you going to have just one address for all of your business operations? Or are you going to have, you know, did you get funding in Bitcoin? And if you if you got money or if, you, or if you're investing your own money, maybe you don't want all of your money to be commingled in one address, mm -hmm. correct? Yeah. So I started talking about corporate governance and what separation of duties looks like. And this was during the time where there were a number of different... Um, news pieces where people had either raised money or taken their customers' money and run away with it. Hmm. And so the problem that I was trying to solve and the problem that my clients were, were interested in solving was how do we prevent that from happening? And it's really easy with Bitcoin because you just implement a multi-sig, yeah, right? Yeah. And so when you implement multi-sig, and I don't just mean two of three signatures, typically we think of two of three, but you know you can have a, a number of different signing configurations. You could even have 15 signers on an account if you wanted to. So when I was working with these companies to implement uh, multi-sig solutions, we were looking at, well, how many people are going to be signers on the account? What are your internal policies? Are you going to take money from your capital account every day, every week, every month, who should sign off on that? And an interesting thing happened. I had a couple of clients who had investors that were Bitcoin savvy. And so we devised these plans where the investor could actually be a signer on their capital account. Hmm. And that was really cool because the investor got to have direct access to that account without having any individual power over it. But they could see at any time what was happening with that account, whether or not they signed a transaction. And they didn't have to wait for management to give them a report. They didn't have to wait to, to connect with a CEO or CTO or whomever hmm. to find out what was happening with that account. Nice. Yeah. So, you know, at, as I was implementing this and as I was thinking about saying yes to these actually holding that third key, I realized that I didn't have the technical acumen to do that. So I started reaching out to people in the community and Andreas happened to be one of those people. And I asked him to help me kind of create a, a best practices plan. And he did that. And we've actually been working behind the scenes for about 10 and a half months before the official launch of Third Key Solutions to do this with a number of different clients. Wow, that's great. Yeah, I'm really excited about it because I think it actually serves a real need in the community. And that need is to have people look at their internal governance and how you're actually going to do recovery in the event of key loss, key compromise, all of these sorts of things. Really, I look at it as a tool to replace regulation. Uh, I'm mm -hmm. a, I prefer technology to regulation in many instances. And so I think by implementing multi-sig technology within businesses and within our community as a voluntary measure, I think that we can supplant uh, the need for regulation. Yeah, I like that. You know, as Andreas would say, he said, the reason I don't like regulation is because it doesn't work. Exactly. <laughs> Absolutely. And we know, of course, sometimes regulation works and we do have to have regulation. Obviously, there are certain things that have to be regulated in this world. But, you know, when we look at some of the bigger regulations, like regulations on Wall Street and, you know, federal regulations and how we know that the lobbying is basically the same thing as just passing money from one person to another. Hey, do me a favor and I'll give you a chunk of money. That's been going on since the beginning of time. I'm sure you're 
you're familiar with Patrick Byrne and the whole concept of being captured and deep capture, right? Absolutely. It's funny because there's still so many red-blooded Americans or blue-blooded Americans or just, you know, people all over the world. But I emphasize Americans because of how we think. I know well how we think because I am an American. But it's so funny how many people are so still so rah-rah wave the flag that if you were to suggest to them that Congress is crooked, even though Samuel Clemens, Mark Twain spoke eloquently as how Holbrook goes around the country still at the age of 80 something representing uh you know doing his show that is mark twain some of what he's talking about in terms of corruption in terms of how regulation doesn't work in congress and in the government and with big businesses some of what mark twain wrote back then in the 1800s sounds exactly like he's talking about what's going on today it's so relevant Absolutely. which really just proves it's been going on for so long and yet you know you'd think something that's been going on that long would be just common knowledge and i think you know under the under the surface i think your average person knows that for instance that washington's rotten in certain ways and they know that wall street's rotten but if you were to ask them any specifics about it or any details they would back off and say well i don't know that it is i just i've heard that it is but you know people who have done a little bit more reading people who are a little bit more educated they know you know they've read they've read the facts they've read the books that uh, make reference to these problems that we have that are so pervasive and so ripe to be disrupted and to be changed and so yeah what you're talking about with multi-signature governance and the whole idea behind what bitcoin can bring once you do understand the tech behind it it's not just a digital currency i think it's something that's really really worth talking about and spreading the news you know it's something that has caused people to become evangelists and rightfully i think absolutely well you know i think to go back to this idea of people not really being interested or, or recognizing that uh, a lot of our political systems are broken, I think a lot of that comes from not feeling empowered, from recognizing, okay, let's say that I do buy into the idea that our political systems are broken. What can I do about it? Hmm. You know, how much time should I spend out of my day focusing on how to solve these problems. And if there really isn't a solution available, then isn't it a waste of my time? And that's what I used to think before Bitcoin. <laughs> <laughs> and, and when I realized the potential of Bitcoin to make these sorts of things transparent, to say to, for example, politicians, okay, let's make campaign finance transparent. Let's use the blockchain. You register your addresses. Let's all take a look at what's actually happening out there. Mm. Let's all do democratic voting through the blockchain. Let's all do, when I saw the power of transparency coupled with scalability with Bitcoin, that's when I knew it was worth, you know, this is the change the world sort of thing. This is the change mm. the world technology. And this is really what drew me to Bitcoin. And yet when you talk with people about Bitcoin, let's say they've only heard about Bitcoin uh, by way of CNN or what have you, or, you know, the Wall Street Journal, yeah. <laughs> then, yeah. you know, you're talking with this person who basically says, well, now I've heard that currency crashed, or I heard that was a scam, or I heard that was a Ponzi scheme, and their whole thinking is on the coin, right? Small B, right. lowercase b, Bitcoin, and they have no knowledge at all. How do you communicate with people to tell them, obviously, you'd like to spend an hour or two with everybody to go into great detail you can't you may only have five minutes or ten minutes you know when you're commuting on a train how do you communicate to somebody hey it's so much more than just a digital currency like the hobo nickel or the barbecue coin or doge coin how do you explain to them that this is a working protocol that is changing how we are going to live our lives how do you explain that it really depends on your audience and so i try to relate whoever i'm talking to what they're actually interested in mm -hmm. so for example right now uh with the Nepal earthquake, uh, the Red Cross is, is accepting Bitcoin and they're accepting it through ChangeTip. So you can use ChangeTip to donate Bitcoin directly to the Red Cross for the Nepalese earthquake. That's a really powerful tool. That's something that, you know, while yes, you could technically, I suppose, text, how do you know where you're texting? Um, mm. 
you can also talk to them about, I have a lot of friends that are artists and musicians. And so I talk to them about getting instant tips. So all it takes is, is putting up a little QR code when you're spinning, for example, if you're a DJ yeah. or putting a QR code next to your artwork. And, you know, are you going to become a multimillionaire from it? Probably not. But, but is it more than what you'd have if you didn't have the QR code up? Yeah, it is. Yeah. If people are interested in voting, I talk to them about voting. If people are interested in contracts, one unifying theme is people like to get rid of lawyers. So um, <laughs> that's one of my ins. You know, I talk about how we can move to a more streamlined process using smart contracts and things like that to ensure performance. Now, I think that there's um, a bit of a misunderstanding in the community generally and, and then also overall as to what a smart contract is. And, and the definition of a smart contract is really dependent upon who you're talking to and what, um, you know, what their preconceived notions of contracts and smart contracts are. Mm -hmm. But at its core, smart contracts can, can streamline the process and it can ensure payment. Where right now, if you and I have a contract and I promise to pay, that's all it is. It's a promise to pay. Mm -hmm. With a smart contract, I actually have to put that money up like we do in escrow, mm -hmm. right? So we can, take, we can take payment tools like escrow and we can bring them into our everyday transactions. We can scale trust mm -hmm. in that way. I like that. I think that's a powerful tool. And I think it's something that's been reserved for um, the elite and for you know, large scale transactions. And the reason is because it's not been financially viable to do escrow on a transaction-wide basis. Yes, until now. Right, exactly, exactly, until now. That's why Bitcoin is so great. You know, a another one of my pet projects is this idea, and I'm not doing it yet, but um, this idea of using the blockchain to transparently show charity donations. Mm. So when we look at uh, nonprofits, we could, in theory, have um, nonprofit organizations register their general addresses, and, and we could have someone write a program that allowed us to see, to translate the information from the blockchain into our traditional financial statements, right? Mm -hmm. Like uh, a balance sheet, like an income statement. All of these things are possible with Bitcoin, and it's possible to do this in a way that is absolutely transparent and verifiable by anyone. So we don't have to trust these audit firms to go in and say, yep, I looked at everything. You can trust me. It's now you can trust we. And I think that's a really powerful shift. Right. And the money saved paying the auditing firms, that money wouldn't have to be paid. Exactly. What a saving, a huge savings. Absolutely. I was going to say, I think it's so rare these days that a business has even heard of Bitcoin. And if they have, again, they're getting the CNN sound bite. They don't realize, hey, right now, it's possible or coming up very soon, it's possible that Bitcoin, this protocol, could actually be saving your company a lot of money, millions. You know, now that we're talking about this, I forgot my, my best sale to lawyers and really to, to anyone in the business community who bills. Um, my best sales pitch for Bitcoin comes from my experience. So the first time I had a client pay me in Bitcoin, I did my typical, you know, I, I did the work and I'm an atypical attorney. I usually do the work first. I don't really like retainers. Okay. Uh, I feel like I should be paid after I'm done with the work. So, um, so typically that's how I do it. And so I did the work and I build the client and I got paid in, are you ready? Three minutes. <laughs> wow. <laughs> and let me tell you what I, I, I was like, really? No, this can't be true because, you know, in, in the non-Bitcoin world, I mean, three days is, is you, you know, you're, you're taking it back. Three days is amazing for payment. Normally, it's more like three weeks, right. three months, you know, and you have to follow up and say, hey, did you get the invoice? And when can you pay? And now I can only pay half and blah, 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 blah. And it takes up all of this time and all this effort. And Bitcoin, three minutes huge selling point for me. In fact, wow. I, I try to only accept payment in Bitcoin now for my legal services because it's so much easier. Why would I even want to deal with a check or a wire transfer or any of this other nonsense when I can just get paid in Bitcoin? Streamlining the process and improving cash flows is a huge deal for businesses. They just don't recognize it right now. Again, I think because, as you said, many businesses are only familiar with the, you know, CNN dark web stories. Right. The child's version of Bitcoin. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Wow. So you have been practicing law for how long? Uh, eight and a half years. 
Wow, eight and a half years. And what kind of law do you practice for the most part? I typically focus on small business. Okay. So uh, really startups. Um, I like to focus on transactional work. So contracts, negotiating contracts, uh, getting just basic contracts in place for businesses that they can use as templates. Mm -hmm. Um, but what I'm really interested in, you know, I, I enjoy, I, I'm one of those, uh, aliens that enjoy, uh, Mm -hmm. writing contracts, (laughs) but, (laughs) but negotiating contracts, but I, I also really like the strategy. I really like the business strategy and talking with them about, okay, well, how do you think this process is going to work within your business? How does this relate to other processes? What are your overall goals? Um, Helping them stay focused, kind of uh, a larger sort of counseling mentorship sort of uh, role. I see. Wow, I bet your clients love you. (laughs) (laughs) I, You know, I'm highly selective with my clients. And yeah, I I usually, I'm much more interested in if I'm a good fit for the client. Yeah. Uh, I think that's the most important thing. And, you know, just because I'm not doesn't mean that, you know, the client's bad or it doesn't mean that I'm bad. It just means that, you know, I need to work with people that I can communicate with and that can communicate with me well. That's my primary focus when I'm looking at whether or not I can help a client. I also have experience in uh, commercial real estate. Um, I worked for a federal judge for a while while I was in law school. That was really fun, uh, really eye-opening. Um, mm-hmm. I've done, you know, I've done a lot of work for a lot of different types of clients, but primarily I try to focus on, on small business. I see. And as far as small businesses go, do you have many clients now? Are the numbers growing? Are you seeing the numbers grow, um, in terms of Bitcoin startups or Bitcoin businesses asking for your help? Yes. Uh, but unfortunately right now I'm not taking any new clients because I just started a startup myself, which is third key <laughs> solutions. So I'm not accepting uh, new clients right at this particular moment. Uh, I'm really, really focused on, on third key and, and how we can serve the community in that capacity. I see. Well, you know, I was going to ask you with bitcoins and gravy, my podcast, I'm in the 65th week. This will be the 65th show. Congratulations. Oh, thank you very much. I was going to ask you, you know, maybe I could get your legal assistance or you could help me. I could hire you to help me with doing something with my business. But then I realized, wow, uh, I'm not making any money and it's just me. And <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> You're in good company, my friend. You are in good company. Many, many people in this space are 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 right there with you. Right. I'm not. I'm not actually. I you know started out as a volunteer, and now I earn LTB coin. Um, yeah. doing the show. And I'm actually, I don't know how many of my listeners know this. I may be letting the cat out of the bag here, but I am actually a LTB coin millionaire. Fantastic. Yep. Yep. Excellent. <laughs> Yep. Yep. Feels pretty good. It feels pretty good. Oh, <laughs> I mean, you don't, you don't need to brag. You don't need to rub it into all of us who are not yet LTB millionaires. And I, but... prob- I probably shouldn't. I probably shouldn't. <laughs> but uh, yeah, LTB coin, I don't know if you're familiar with it, but uh, I know that, you know, you're super busy, but gosh darn it. If you get a chance when this show airs, always I have uh, loyal listeners who are following the show and who will comment in the comment section there on Let's Talk Bitcoin. So right. if you have time, I'm certain that some people will be asking questions. Usually what I do is I say, okay, well, I'll take that question. I will ask the person I interviewed and I will get back with you here on the comment section. It happens occasionally that the person I interviewed will actually sign up for an account on LTB, a free account, mm-hmm. and they will just appear there in the comment section after the show answering these questions and stimulating the conversation and moving it forward so you're welcome to do that Uh, it's not it's not required i know you're super busy i suggest that also because maybe you know there would be a way for you to network with people that uh, would enhance your business or whose businesses you could enhance just if through nothing else but a positive word or directing them as you did with the information you gave me earlier about Common Accord and the blockchain workshop. Absolutely. I'm happy to do that. And although I'm not accepting new clients right at this particular second, um, I do have a a wide network of attorneys who are practicing in this space. So I do work, uh, I do refer people depending on, you know, where they're located and what their needs are. If I know someone who's practicing in that space, I'm happy to make a referral. 
Okay, well, that's great. Now, so how do you see your business growing? Is it growing exponentially, as they say, the Bitcoin technology, you know, the Bitcoin startups? They say the whole thing is growing, other than the price of Bitcoin, the currency, yeah. <laughs> is growing exponentially. <laughs> are you seeing that? Are you seeing that people are coming out of the woodwork, uh, these Bitcoin startups, the legitimate ones? Are you seeing these? Oh, yeah. Okay. I mean, I get contacted by multiple startups every week asking me for help um, in this space and, and asking me for referrals. So okay. I've definitely seen an increase. Okay. Well, that's great. So obviously you have no plans to stop doing this. Now, you know, what about the price of Bitcoin, the currency? What do you think about that? I like to ask people about that just to get their opinion. Some people will be bold and give just, you know, full on predictions for where they think the price is going to go. But how do you feel that the price of Bitcoin uh, is going to do over the next couple of years? And how do you feel that that could affect your work or the entire Bitcoin sphere, the Bitcoin community? Great question. I usually don't make predictions. <laughs> and, you know, as far as the, the price itself goes, all of us would like to see the price high. Uh, but there is something to be said for for a lower price point, and that is inclusion. So, so as the price is lower, it's it's a little less scary to get in. The price doesn't really affect me and what I do, uh, and the reason is because when I'm paid in Bitcoin, I don't mind if I need to convert some of the Bitcoin to fiat in order to pay my bills. I do that. Otherwise, you know, I'm willing to take the risk of of the price rising or falling. That's just me. I know yeah. a lot of people are, are a little uh, more risk adverse than that. But for me, um, I, I think it's much more important to see how Bitcoin uh, is actually going to change things over the next few years. I'm much more interested mm. in, in thinking about that than I am about the price. Yeah, me too. Absolutely. Okay, so Pamela, we've covered a lot of ground so far, but I've not heard enough from the CEO of Third Key Solutions, and that is you. I'd love to hear more about Third Key Solutions. Great. I'd love to talk about it. The reason I want to talk about it is because I'm so excited about it, not just because I'm the CEO, but because I think that uh, the company is actually providing a service that the community needs. Okay. As I mentioned before, this company really grew out of a need of my clients saying over and over again, will you hold a third key for me? What does that look like? How do we ensure that your business is set up on the inside for success? Mm -hmm. Not just how you face your clients, but also internally, how can we make sure that you have good practices? How can we make sure that you're not gonna have one employee that's gonna run away with all the money? Mm -hmm. um, and so as I was looking at this and as this corporate governance developed, third key grew directly from that need from the need of businesses in the space to really understand and, and kind of put into place not only a plan for good corporate governance, but then also recovery. Mm -hmm. And, you know, if your listeners are asleep, I apologize, but I'm about to wake you up. <laughs> what happens, for example, if you have if you have a two of three multi-sig and you, John, are a signer, I'm a signer, and the T company down the road from you, mm -hmm. um, they're a signer. So let's say that I'm your I'm your third party. What happens if, God forbid, your laptop goes in the pool? Yeah. What happens if you don't have access to that key for whatever reason? Maybe it's lost. Maybe it's stolen. Maybe you got hacked. Maybe, God forbid, there's a fire. Maybe there's something that happens. How do businesses continue to operate in times of emergency? Hmm. And a lot of businesses in the space aren't actually looking at that. And so that's, I think, one of the key services that... Uh, third key recovery, no pun intended, offers mm -hmm. is, is the ability to come in and say, hey, we've implemented these recovery plans before. We've implemented these corporate governance plans before. These are the things that you should be looking for. And while every company is different, every company is going to implement these ideas in different ways. We can be the other people on, on the other side of the table saying, hey, have you thought about this? What about that? You know, we can't, we can't plan for every situation, but we can plan for a lot of situations. And the benefit of planning at the beginning is that then when the emergency happens, it's not 2 a.m. and you're frantically making phone calls and texts. Right. Right. So this is the benefit. Also, we want to try to prevent against, against spoofs. 
So this idea of, well, let's say that the three of us are all holding keys and I get an email from quote unquote John that says, hey, my laptop went in the pool. Can you sign this recovery transaction for me? That is our entire 250 Bitcoin. Right. Can you transfer this to a new, this other address? Well, when should I do that? When should I not do that? Right. What kind of approval do I need from you? How do I really know that came from you? And if you don't have all of that set up in advance, you're going to make a mistake, yeah. <laughs> really. You know, that's what it boils down to. If you don't have a plan in place, the chances of you actually losing your Bitcoin grow exponentially. So instead, taking a few minutes to actually write down a plan and talking it out amongst your business partners is a really, really good practice. It's an industry best practice outside of the realm of Bitcoin, and it should be an industry best practice for companies that are operating in the cryptocurrency space. Absolutely. And I loved your website where you have a list of what we do, and then you have a long list also of what we do not do. Yeah. <laughs> I think that's great. <laughs> well, I, we want to be, our goal is to be as transparent as possible. So you'll also notice on our website, we list our pricing. We do that because we want people to know. We don't believe in kind of backdoor agreements. Oh, well, you know, for you, we'll do this and we <laughs> right. know you. So we, we really... Um, we embrace the transparent nature of Bitcoin, and we try to do that in all of our business practices. And that's a core value of Third Key Solutions, and that's a core value of you know the principles of Third Key Solutions as well. I'd just like to talk a little bit about the Key Recovery Network. Do you know anything about it? I do not, I must confess. Oh, good. Well, you wouldn't really. That was kind of a trick question uh, <laughs> because we announced the the creation or the formation of the Key Recovery Network when we announced Third Key Solutions at the very end of March. So the essence of the Key Recovery Network, it's an industry association and we're working with a number of different other companies uh, in the Bitcoin space that are operating in key storage and recovery only to create this network where we can define what best practices are as far as recovery goes, mm -hmm. where we can streamline the process for businesses and customers. Okay. This grew out of a need when we were sitting around talking and thinking about, okay, what exactly do we want to offer? What services do we really want to offer? And what does the community need? Not only do they need multi-signature uh, storage and you know setup and recovery, but we also need backups for our own keys. This comes from the idea that many of us are not so great at cold storage. Hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So a lot of times what happens is people create a wallet and they have this cold storage option and they're not really sure what to do with it. And so they print out a cold storage wallet on a piece of paper and they put it somewhere, not really sure where. Mm -hmm. um, and hopefully they put it you know, in a fireproof safe. But we're not really sure if they actually know how to execute it. And we don't really know if they understand, number one, how to store it properly, right? So not only in a fireproof safe, but what about water? You know, do you have an extra backup, et cetera, et cetera. Mm -hmm. And the reason that this all matters, because as you know, if you lose your keys, you lose your Bitcoin. Yeah. You can't access it anymore. So we need a way for companies who are holding a lar large amounts of Bitcoin or even individuals who are, who are holding what they deem to be large amounts of Bitcoin to be able to back up their private keys. But the key is we don't want them to back it up with one party, right? Right. So John, you're not gonna give me your private key to your Bitcoin address. Probably, Number one, I'd, I'd never not. take it. Yeah, probably I'd not. never take it <laughs> <laughs> because that would give me the full ability, just like a joint bank account, right? Mm -hmm. if, if you have a joint bank account, either party can take out all the money. And that's the same thing if two people have a private key. Right. So how do we solve that problem? How do we increase the likelihood that people are going to actually be able to recover their funds in case something goes bad, but also not give custody? We don't want to recreate the banking model. We don't want to say, okay, we'll give this other this other trusted person our private keys. Why would we do that? We don't have to. Right. So how can we use the technology to protect us? Well, one way is you can use this really cool thing called um, Shamir's secret sharing. Have you heard of that? I have not. Okay. So uh, I am not the CTO of Third Key Solutions. Let me just put that out there now. So I'm just going to share with you the layperson's version of Shamir's secret. But basically what it is, is you take a secret, which in this case is a private key, mm -hmm. and you use this sharing mechanism to split it out into a number of different pieces. And each piece alone can't do anything. Mm -hmm. But when you combine the pieces then that recreates the secret. 
in I this like case, it. yeah, I know, right? Isn't it cool? It's great. So, so in this case, you could create a sharing scheme whereby you could split one private key into five pieces. And you could say, all right, any three of these will recombine in order to give us access to the private key. They'll recombine to make that private key. You could give it to five different companies, each a piece. And those companies don't even need to know who else is holding the private bits, Mm -hmm. right? When something bad happens, you, John, can say, oh, okay, let me call Third Key Solutions. Let me call these other companies and say, okay, I need you to send me your piece. And you could actually recreate your own password even if you lost everything, wow. even if you lost your computer, your, your cell phone, your everything, even if you lost everything, you could still have access to your Bitcoin if you do it this way. I love that. Yeah, I do too. So that's why we decided to create the Key Recovery Network, because obviously we can't do this on our own. We need other people in the industry, our quote unquote competitors, to work with us to create a system whereby you, John, could say, okay, I know that I'm going to contract with these people. They're part of the key recovery network. And they all know how to work together in the event that I need them to. So we're all going to give you the key, the key back or the, the part back in the same way. Mm-hmm. You're going to know what it's going to cost up front. You're going to know how to do this, right? Mm-hmm. So this is the overall idea of the key recovery network. And it's going to launch probably near the end of summer of this summer okay, uh, with at least two partners. We have two partners right now. One is Keeper and that is Michael Perklin's company. And you might know Michael because he is part of uh, Bitcoin Sultans. Yes. And he's also part of the, the C4, so the, the CBP exam. And yes. he's also working on the CCSS security standards. And then Armory is another partner of ours that's starting this network. So we're working with them. You'll also um, note that there are different jurisdictions involved, and that's an important part of the key recovery network. So we want to decentralize our own business, and that's kind of how we do it. Wow, I love that. Now, let me ask you a question for someone like me. Let's say I've got a paper wallet and I've got 20 Bitcoins on it. Is this something that's worth the cost of me working with your company to make sure that these are safe? You know, I I think that's an individual question for each person. First of all, we don't really work with individuals. We we work with um, businesses in the space. Yes. So, for example, you're on the LTB network, Mm -hmm. right? So we might work directly with the LTB network to secure their coins. I see. But we do sometimes work with individuals. It really just depends on the amount and the way that you want to store what you feel comfortable with. So there are a lot of multi-sig solutions that are available now, uh, Green Address or BitGo, or um, I actually have a tutorial on my website about how you can create your own multi-sig address uh, using Coinbin, which is kind of an open source tool that will allow you to do that. And it'll allow you to execute transactions on your own without going through a specific provider. Oh, nice. Okay. So, yeah, there are a lot of different uh, opportunities right now. And this space is growing. So, you know, it's hard for me to give advice um, without having a, a bigger conversation about what this might look like. You know, if you're sure that you can recover your paper wallets, paper wallets are still a great way to store cold storage. Mm-hmm. The problem is, is as you know, once you open up that paper wallet, it's no longer cold storage. Right. So you need to sweep all of the funds from that paper wallet somewhere. Mm -hmm. Now, you might sweep it to another paper wallet. You might sweep part of it to a multi-sig wallet. You might, you know, there are a lot of different options that you have. And it really depends on your appetite for risk, how much you want to go online and move things to warmer storage versus cold storage. And these are all decisions that, you know, we would kind of talk through if this was something that you wanted to do. Okay. Yeah. Because there is that risk point when you're taking something from your safe paper wallet and deciding to move it somewhere else. It's like, wow, am I going to do this online or how am I going to do this so that I don't get ripped off or that I don't make that one little fatal mistake? Yeah. It's uh, exactly scary well, stuff. And- well, and there's there's one more thing to take into consideration. I don't mean to muddy up the waters, but um, you know, you've got 20, 20 Bitcoin sitting on a paper wallet. What happens if, God forbid, something happens to you? Yeah. Does your family know 
how to get those Bitcoin? Do they know how to access it? Is there someone, you know, does your estate planning attorney, if you've talked to someone, if you've created a will, are these included in your will? If no. so, how are they included? Pretty right? much, pretty much gone. Right, exactly. So <laughs> this is another thing that that you know I do as part of my law practice is I'll work with estate planning attorneys or people that say, hey, you know what, this is part of my estate. I want to make sure that you know we can access it. And while, of course, I can't guarantee because you never can guarantee recoverability of funds, mm-hmm. um, I can work with you. And really quickly, another important point. Whenever you're moving money either to a paper wallet or to a multi-signature address or even to a regular address, please, please, please test it first. Yes. Don't move (laughs) money. Don't move all of your Bitcoin onto an untested wallet. Please test the process. And this is something that um, people are are reluctant to do. You know, they're they're excited. They're like, okay, I want to move this. I want to be done with it. I don't want to deal with it anymore. Oh, you know, it's funny. I remember back in 2011 when I was first getting into Bitcoin and trying to figure the whole thing out and reading online. And I was fascinated by the whole thing, of course, but I couldn't figure it out. So, I'm, you know, every day I'm learning a little bit more, a little bit more, a little bit more. And I finally get to the point where I can make a paper wallet and where I can send some, hey, rednecks, stop banging. You're killing me. <laughs> Oh my gosh. No. No. Yeah, but so I'm fi- I finally get to the point where I can do these things and I can do these things safely, but I did take that advice that was given that you just gave and that is start small. Use just a use something that's less than $5. I think though Yeah. I think I did make a few mistakes and I think, you know, I lost 10 or 20 bucks here or in my memory at the time was the equivalent of 10 or $20, maybe hundreds now, I can't even remember. <laughs> right. It, the things were weird in those early days. Uh, it was just, you know, uncharted territory. Absolutely. Well, and, and what's nice about the industry is it's it's starting to mature and it's starting to recognize that we need to make things easier. Yes. Right. We need to make things easier. We need to be able to, we need to have these best practices in place. We need to grow as an industry overall, not only in the way that we interact with end users and customers, but also in the way that we're doing business behind the scenes. And I think that, you know, 2015, we're moving in that direction. I think there are a lot of companies that are offering solutions that are much easier to use, much easier to implement. And it's my hope that those days of, oh, no, I had to try four paper wallets and (laughs) lost half of it. (laughs) Hopefully those are behind us. I hope so, too. Yeah, we're moving toward the future rapidly here at the dawn of the age of cryptocurrencies, as I like to say. And uh, it sounds to me like Third Key Solutions is going to be leading the charge there. Pamela Morgan, thank you so much for being on Bitcoins and Gravy. Listeners, you've been listening to Pamela Morgan, the CEO of Third Key Solutions. Thanks so much for having me. I really enjoyed our talk, and I hope to do this again. Absolutely. Yeah, we'll uh, talk down the road and you can give us an update. That would be great. Sounds good. Thanks. Hey, and if you happen to run into Andreas, tell him I said hi. I'll do it. (laughs) All right. Hey, thanks a lot. Talk to you later. Bye. Bye. And I know that it may sound absurd, but I have for you a magic word. And today the magic word is world. W-O-R-L-D, world, as in this sentence taken from an excerpt from John Perry Barlow's A Declaration of the Independence of Cyberspace. And here we go. Check this out. Governments of the industrial world, you weary giants of flesh and steel, I come from cyberspace, the new home of mind. On behalf of the future, I ask you of the past to leave us alone. You are not welcome among us. You have no sovereignty where we gather. We are forming our own social contract. This governance will arise according to the conditions of our world, not yours. Our world is different. Ours is a world that is both everywhere and nowhere, but it is not where bodies live. We will create a civilization of the mind in cyberspace. May it be more humane and fair than the world your governments have made before. Again, listeners, that great quote was provided for us by our good friend from Yale University, Ian Palshev, and that was a quote from John Perry Barlow's A Declaration of the Independence of Cyberspace.
Hey podcast listeners, I'm Carrie, and I'm here to tell you about something really powerful that's happening. Nepal recently suffered a tragic earthquake. Thousands of lives were lost, and people around the world are wanting to help. Fortunately, Red Cross has opened a Bitcoin wallet with ChangeTip and is now accepting Bitcoin donations. In just a matter of days, thousands of dollars have poured into this account turning bitcoins into food and supplies for those in need. With ChangeTip, we can send bitcoins through Twitter and use our social platforms to build momentum towards giving. We can give any amount, no matter how small, and together, it really adds up. So, to open an account, go to changetip.com. There, you can buy bitcoins or transfer from your bitcoin wallet. Start giving, and if you want, Redirect the gifts people give you to go to Red Cross. Let's use these amazing tools we've created to pull each other up and show the world the value of Bitcoin through generosity. Folks, we have a special treat for you. Another loyal listener who has taken it upon himself to cover Ode to Satoshi, the official Bitcoin song. This time it's Alex O'Brien giving us his version of Ode to Satoshi. And for more information about Alex O'Brien, please check out the show notes and the credits there at Let's Talk Bitcoin. Take it away, Alex O'Brien. Well, Satoshi Nakamoto, that's a name I love to say. And we don't know much about him, but he came to save the day. When he wrote about the way things are and the way things are to be. Gave us all a protocol this world had never seen. Oh, Bitcoin as we're going into the old blockchain. Bitcoin, I know you're going to rain. Going to rain. Tell everybody knows, everybody knows, everybody knows your name. Down the road we'll be told about the death of old Mount Cox About traders trading altar coins and miners mining blocks Them good old boys back in Illinois and on down through Tennessee See they don't care to be a millionaire, they just want to be free Your Bitcoin has gone into the old blockchain Oh, Bitcoin, I know you're gonna win, gonna win. Tell everybody knows, everybody knows, everybody knows your name. of Calcutta to the halls of Parliament While bankers count our money out for every government All Bitcoin flies on through the skies of virtuality They promise to deliver us from age old tyranny All Bitcoin has gone into the old blockchain All Bitcoin, I know you're gonna rain Gonna tell everybody knows, everybody knows, everybody knows. Give me some exposure, everybody knows your name. Oh Lord, pass me some more. Oh Lord, before I go. I'd like
like to thank my guest on today's show, Attorney Pamela Morgan, the CEO of Third Key Solutions. To quote Third Key Solutions, we securely generate and store one to three supplemental keys for your internal multi-signature business operations accounts. Friends, this is the future, so listen to the man when he tells you to climb aboard. A quick announcement also, a good friend of mine, Elise Peterson, the owner of TLIT.com, is looking for an easy way to send money around the world using Bitcoin. So listeners, if you have information for Elise, please email her via TLIT.com at info at TLIT.com or open up a discussion with all of us in the show notes at Let's Talk Bitcoin.com. By the way, TLIT, T-E-A-L-E-T.com is a fantastic source for fair trade teas directly from the growers. Elise and other good folks at TLIT.com work tirelessly to help empower people working in the tea trade around the world. But the best thing about TLIT.com is that they accept Bitcoin and light Bitcoin payments. Thanks for your question, Elise. And if I'm not mistaken, I believe it's tea time. And great news, listeners, our transcription page is now live on the website thanks to the continuing hard work of one of our loyal listeners who is also a consultant to the show. These professional transcriptions are provided by one of our fans who can be found at diaryofafreelancetranscriptionist.com. And of course, you can find a link to this website in the weekly show notes. And if you've enjoyed the show, please take a minute to scan my QR code or copy my public key and send me 50 cents in Bitcoin. If you'll do this every once in a while, it will help me out more than you know. Folks, it's not easy being a podcast host, trust me, and putting in 10 hours each week to produce the show sometimes takes its toll. Remember that giving someone a small tip in Bitcoin is what makes Bitcoin folks stand out in this world. I know personally that whenever I give a tip to someone on Reddit or Let's Talk Bitcoin or one of the forums, I feel better about myself knowing that I've given back just a little to help that person continue creating great content. And signing off now from East Nashville, Tennessee, I am your host, John Barrett, here with my dog, Maxwell. Say goodbye, Maxwell. Join us again next week for another episode of Bitcoins and Gravy. And until then, y'all be good to each other out there. And remember, the only thing necessary for the triumph of evil is for good men and women to do nothing. Do something, y'all. Now climb aboard, y'all. This train is bound for glory. And there's plenty of room for all. Well, Satoshi Nakamoto, that's a name I love to say. And we don't know much about him, but he came to save the day. When he wrote about the way things are and the way things ought to be, he gave us all a protocol this world had never seen. A bit Bitcoin, as you're going into the old blockchain Oh, Bitcoin, I know you're going to rain, gonna rain Till everybody knows, everybody knows, till everybody knows your name Down the road it will be told about the death of old Mount Gox About traders trading altar coins and miners mining blocks But them good old boys back in Illinois and on down through Tennessee See, they don't care to be a millionaire, they're just wanting to be free Oh, Bitcoin, as you're going into the old blockchain Oh, Bitcoin, I know you're going to rain, going to rain Till everybody knows, everybody knows, till everybody knows your name A promise to deliver us from age-old tyranny A Bitcoin as you're 
Bitcoin into the old blockchain Oh Bitcoin, I know you're going to rain, going to rain Till everybody knows, everybody knows, till everybody knows your name Till everybody knows, everybody knows, till everybody knows your Give me some exposure Everybody knows your name, sing it Oh Lord, pass me some more Oh Lord, before I have to go Oh Lord, pass me some more Oh Lord, before I have to go